This is the Business of Apps podcast, bringing you actionable insights from the leaders of the global app industry and the world's fastest growing apps. You can find more app news, data and analysis over at businessofapps.com. Welcome to the Business of Apps podcast. On this show, we invite app industry professionals to cover various topics, and we promise to do our best to keep it both insightful but brief. In this episode, we have Andy Carvel, partner at Teacher. Andy, welcome to Zimbabwe's of Us podcast. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me on the show, Art. Great. Thank you for coming. So, um, no matter what, if you're serious about building something, like building a house, car, spaceship, you name it, or your mobile app, you need a plan or what we call an IT, a stack. I'm sure you see where I'm going with this. I have Andy Carvel on the episode and I've mentioned a stack, right? In this episode, we're going to be talking about mobile growth stack, the mobile growth stack, and to be precise, 2022 edition. So before doing that, let's talk about you, Andy. First, uh, tell us about yourself, your background. Uh, sure, it'd be a pleasure. Um, so yeah, my background is actually uh, on the techie side of things. Uh, I was um, a developer before I kind of got into the world of, of marketing and growth. I was uh, I was making software for many years. So um, my, my father actually taught me how to code, I think around the age of like five or six um, on early home computer systems in, in the UK. Um, mm -hmm. So, um, and all I wanted to do was make games. So it's uh, it's interesting that you made mentioned uh, building spaceships. I will uh, I'll get to that in a moment. But uh, yeah, I was um, I was making games all through my childhood um, in on you know sort of home computer systems, um, and then I went to university, studied computer science, um, was applying for jobs in the games industry. After that, I, I built a PlayStation game for my final year project. I had built a, a Game Boy Advance game as a kind of a demo to try and get like interviews in the industry. Um, and I just happened to, to, to land at uh, Nokia actually, who were hiring for game developers for um, their, their new R and D facility in the, the South of England. I'm, I'm from the UK. And uh, so my first job out of university was um, to go and work for, for Nokia in uh, research and development. Um, developing games for uh, for their mobile phones, and uh, mm. that was uh, a super kind of interesting time. Like mobile was just kind of taking off. This was back in 1999, yeah. Um, and yeah, it was like a really interesting challenge from a resource optimization point of view, trying to squeeze um, a decent game into 84 by 48 pixels on a monochrome display um, with. Uh, you know, limited RAM, limited ROM, had to basically fit like all of the, the code and data into 16 kilobytes. Um, yeah, it was uh, it was actually great fun. Uh, and I made a game there called Space Impact, which was a, a side scrolling shoot 'em up game. Uh, one of the probably the, the first or definitely one of the first arcade games on a mobile phone. Um, so um, that's I, I spent a lot of time building spaceships there. Um, oh, I see. Yeah, this is where the spaceships are coming in. Exactly. All right. I think it's one of the best ways to be introduced to the to something you're going to be de devoting your life to uh, from the very beginning, from your early age, when many things became to you, like when at the age when you can uh, learn so many things easy easier than uh, supposed to, you would try to start coding. You know, when you're te even teenager or later. So that's probably. Um, yeah, that's in my estimate, that's the best way to get a professional later on for your life, starting very early. And yeah, building spaceships, even as a game, is a nice adventure. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's not like precisely it's just shooting them into space like in SpaceX, but I guess that's the next best thing, building a game about spaceship. Okay, um, Let's uh, move to the major topic on the table today, which is the mobile growth stack. So hmm. tell me about the concept. How did you guys decided to do this thing? And uh, to me, it looks like a map for a uh, marketing team uh, behind the app, what they should do overall. How do you see it? Uh, what was the genesis of this thing? Uh, yeah, okay, so I'll, I'll come to the second point in a moment um, as, as to sort of, you know, what the purpose is, but um, yeah, so it's sort of the genesis of the, the mobile growth stack. So after many years um, making mobile games, I, I kind of took a bit of a, a detour um, I, and I went to business school 
um, where I did a, a 12 year intensive MBA uh, at Warwick in uh, Warwick Business School in the UK. Um, and kind of coming out of that, I ended up in Berlin uh, to write my dissertation to, to sort of finish my, my course. Uh, I was working uh, at a company called SponsorPay, they're now called Fiber, they're an ad network. Um, you, I'm sure you're familiar with them. Um, so I wrote my dissertation there um, and then ended up joining SoundCloud, um, who were already like a you know growing platform at that point. I think I joined uh, 2011, uh, that I was employee number 89, I think. And uh, they brought me on, they were specifically looking for somebody with mobile experience. So I had like, I think at that point, around 10, 15 years of mobile experience. And um, they they saw a big opportunity for mobile, but they they weren't really sure how to capitalize on it. They saw like organically mm -hmm. that they were getting more and more mobile traffic. They had a couple of mobile apps, uh, you know, Android and iOS, but um, you know, they were, you know, it was kind of the sideshow to, to, to the, the web product, which is where they were seeing, you know, where they started basically. So they wanted to help help to transition from being a mobile a web first company to a mobile first company. And that's mm -hmm. why they brought me on. And um, you know, I, Hope that I was of some help there over the, the four and a half years that I was there, and uh, certainly was a fantastic opportunity to to work in a high growth environment. Um, you know, lots of data to work with. Um, you know, crazy cohorts of, of new users to play with and, and to run experiments with. Um, and uh, yeah, basically to get back to your question, um, the mobile growth stack basically came about as me explaining my job and my mm -hmm. approach to uh, the leadership at SoundCloud who who didn't know much about mobile and you know that, that so it's like kind of a real education step needed um, so that I could kind of make a case for you know the strategy that I was building out there and and to get the resources and the the remit to do the work that I, I needed to do in order to, to grow the mobile app so I basically put together this this kind of what was originally just sort of a one one page slide um, for, in a management presentation explaining um, you know the, the growth strategy for, for mobile um, and I kind of broke out some of the key levers for growth as I saw them for the SoundCloud app uh, initially um, mm -hmm. and yeah this basically you know it, uh, it became uh, and later the the mobile growth stack I, I I kind of I think I presented this this diagram at a, a course that I was teaching in, in Berlin at General Assembly uh, I was teaching like a mobile business course and I noticed that people were very interested in this particular slide. It seemed like it was a kind of, I'd managed to kind of synthesize or condense quite a lot of information into a, a form which, you know, had some organization around it and really helped people to kind of, kind of crystallize like, okay, this is what it, these are, these are the kind of levers for growth for a mobile app. And so I, I kind of kept developing that to a point where I could publish that as, um, uh, as a blog post. Um, mm -hmm. That went kind of viral and and, and got kind of picked up or like all around the industry. I presented it at a conference. I think it was the App Promotion Summit back in 2014. Um, and it really kind of seemed to to land very well in the industry. Um, and yeah, a lot of folks, I think, um, you know, found it very helpful. So back to the, the second point of your question, um, you know, what what exactly is it, right? So the mobile growth stack is essentially... I call it like a one page cheat sheet for, for mobile marketers or mobile growth practitioners. Um, it essentially breaks out and, and organizes uh, in a kind of a structure, the different levers for growth for, for a mobile app, the different kind of activities um, that you might want to consider employing in order to grow a mobile, mobile product, a mobile app. Um, and it's organized by the kind of funnel stages, acquisition, engagement, retention, monetization. And over time, I've added additional kind of supporting layers to that. So analytics and insights, technology, and uh, yeah, in the latest version, uh, even some additional stuff around st strategic management and things like that. So the idea is like it fits on one page uh, and it provides an overview of the option space. Now, um, I will stop talking in a second because I'm sure you've got yeah. more questions, but just back to your, your, I think you mentioned that, you know, this is uh, something which can be like, um, like a, a list of the things that need to be done by a team in yep. order to grow, grow an app. I think that's one of the major misconceptions actually about the mobile growth stack, right? There's lots of stuff in it. If, if, you've, if you've seen it and you can see it at mobilegrowthstack.com, um, you know, it's, it's quite a busy 
um, page. There's a lot of information on there. Uh, and I think one of the things which people often think is that they have to do all of these things in order to succeed. Right. Um, and that's absolutely not the case. It's designed to be a tool for strategic planning um, and, and strategy, um, I, I believe, is all about focus. So it's about making trade-offs, um, deciding what to focus on and what not to do. Um, and so, you know, I'd say, you know, whilst a company might do more of the activities in the stack over time as they grow and they have more resources and they can build more competencies and bring in more technology. Um, I've never seen a company that's doing everything in the stack and neither would I recommend to do everything. Um, you know, it's all about kind of using this to understand like what are your options? Um, you can kind of you know, use the stack to kind of make strategic decisions based on an understanding of like, what are you, what are you choosing to do? And what are the things which you're deliberately choosing to, to leave off the table for now, at least? So definitely not a to-do list, but kind of right. a overall landscape of what can be done uh, like the whole and every uh, member of a marketing team should see which part applicable, which, which part of this landscape can actually be applicable to a specific app, to a specific project they're working on what make, would make sense or what would make sense in terms of, you know, better growth, more sustainable growth, what kind of a, like, how many people are in the team actually to pull off the whole thing, uh, which is not possible, as you've said. But this is kind of a, instead of keeping the whole thing in your memory, you're putting on the paper, quote unquote, so we can see like, what is the um, landscape of your opportunity to work on a project? Now, exactly. But, Let's walk th through uh, like the major chapters. Uh, to me, it a little bit looks like the table of elements, the chemical elements. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like the second table I can remember in my memory, memory would, which would pop up quickly but would be that table. So let's start with acquisition. What are we putting into this basket? Uh, and uh, I added a couple of new elements actually this year. I just, just um put it like a major re revamp of the, the stack for 2022. So uh, I'm going to go through the latest one, which you can okay. find at the Let's stack. do that. Com. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So we added actually um, brand and content uh, in the acquisition layer. Uh, I should point out, by the way, that some of these um, cells, as we call them, or like activities, basically every every cell in the stack is an activity that you, you might do, um, except in the tech layer where it's actually describing bits of bits of tech. Um, so some of these cells actually cut through layers. So uh, we've got brand and content there cutting through acquisition, engagement and retention and monetization, meaning that like if you get these things right, they can be a multiplier across all of those funnel stages. So, um, but yeah, back to the acquisition layer. So we've got brand and content up at the top um, and then organic acquisition with app store optimization, uh, paid, paid marketing, so performance marketing, influencer marketing, cross promotion, uh, which we're seeing becoming increasingly uh, important actually. So things like web to app or sometimes app to web or Mm -hmm. uh, app to um, to set top box and things like that. We're seeing sort of, you know, these multi device journeys becoming uh, pretty important to to measure and and deploy effectively. Um, right, carrying on, we've got virality, um, content indexing, community. Um, so community being could be both community support, providing like good support for your users, as well as um, uh, yeah, community engagement, actually going out and building communities um, in places like, you know, Reddit or Twitter or wherever else, um, you know, users are gathering and talking about your product. So again, <laughs> community is, is another one. Uh, all of these, the bottom community, international retargeting and partnerships and integrations are, again, um, elements that cut right through the stack. So through acquisition, engagement and retention and monetization, because we see if you do these things right, they can be like yeah. a catalyst. So yeah, that's that's the acquisition, and yeah, that's that's uh, one of the things that people should remember about this uh, uh, stack is that, like you've said, uh, even though we're we're we're, we're going to be covering a specific parts, like the major parts of this stack, but uh, components of these parts are applicable to several big parts, which is like which is the point you have to realize, like uh on what stage a specific activity is applicable and uh, build your strategy based on this do not 
lose the fo like the focus on um, which activities are related to specific stage. Now, moving on to the engagement and retention, what is important here? Yeah, this is this is a great one because um, you know, like we put product right at the forefront of that. I think uh, it's really important to bear in mind that you know, if you don't have an engaging product, then you can forget about doing things like activity notifications or some of the other stuff in this layer. Um, you know, mm -hmm. you're not going to you know sustainably move the needle in terms of engagement and retention if you don't have a great product, right? Or at least at least a product that some people find great. Um, Consider so, great. Mm -hmm. So uh, you know, product is definitely the most important lever in this in this section. Um, we've included also brand and content. Uh, again, these can be great multipliers for engagement. Um, and then we've got uh, onboarding and activation, typically a very key lever. Pretty much everybody is going to be working on on that uh, on an ongoing basis. Like uh, onboarding and activation is is rarely ever considered finished. Um, and there's usually a lot of upside there. Uh, and then we've got things like activity notifications. Um, applied behavioral science. Uh, this is a new addition in 22. So this is things like gamification, um, looking at cognitive biases and things like this, sort of basically applying um, a lot of the stuff that, for example, near EL talks about and, and has, mm -hmm. has done some great work around, um, you know, how to kind of apply behavioral science to, uh, to drive engagement in, in, in apps and products. Uh, we've got lifecycle marketing, uh, I've just made that a little bit distinct from activity notifications because it's a little bit broader. Um, the distinction I make there is like lifecycle marketing is really about what stage of the lifecycle is the user in at that point. Um, so, you know, maybe they're a new user, maybe they're a lapsed user. And, you know, you're, you're basically addressing these segments um, differently with, with targeted messaging to try to kind of um, move them through the lifecycle in the most kind of optimal way versus activity notifications, which is really about letting the user know about something that's happening external to them. Uh, like, for example, at SoundCloud, you know, we built an activity notification service that would let people know about new content hitting the platform and things like that. So that, right. that's a distinction there. Um, and then again, um, we've got a bunch of stuff that cuts right through the stack, virality, content indexing, community, international retargeting, partnerships and integrations. I should say that applied behavioral science is one of the welcomest addition to this uh, stack, at least to me, because uh, quite often uh, we forget, you know, we being focused on numbers only, forgetting that we're actually creating, developing a product for people who have certain habits. They have, you know, each of those individuals have the some you know, specific behavior and the interaction between your product and that people. Well, essentially comes down to how well this product is uh, delivering a value for that person, what is interaction and psychologically, psychologically how uh, that person is interact with your app. So factoring in, factoring in this thing into the overall stack is really important uh, in my estimation. But that is a great addition. Now, let's move to the bucket which uh, dear to heart to every uh, app developer monetization uh, that's the ultimate reason why we're coming to creating a products very few of us are hobbyists for the most part we're coming into this thing for to make money that's the business so what's what goes into the monetization basket yeah and i'm going to skip the ones which are like cutting through all of the layers because i already mentioned them twice yep. uh, so yep. uh, yeah so the monetization stuff specifically so what we're seeing is a big trend actually towards subscription becoming the the dominant monetization model um, as well as hybrid models which maybe combine subscription with maybe advertising for folks who are not subscribers maybe you subscribe mm -hmm. to remove the ads um, uh, and or you know maybe paid paid things that you can top up a subscription with to buy specific functionality or premium content on top of a subscription. So just a bit of a precursor. And we, we added some stuff around subscription for this reason into the latest 22 stack uh, because we see it being such so important. Um, so yeah, the first, the first element would be um, the revenue model. Um, so that's basically, you know, trying to decide how you're going to monetize your users. So exactly these, these kind of things that I just mentioned, is it, um, you know, is it a paid app? Is it, uh, do you have in-app purchases? Um, is it a subscription recurring model right. uh, or is it, you know, ad, ad funded or, um, you know, or, or is it some kind of hybrid of, you know, a mixed model? Um, then we have payment processing. Um, 
So payment processing typically has been done, you know, more or less by the app stores. So the, the, you know, the Apple app store and Google play store over the last few years, but now they're really being forced to open up um, the, uh, you know, their, their, their payment flows and basically allow other forms of payment. So we see this payment processing mm -hmm. becoming even more um, relevant, um, you know, as we go forward through 22, um, then we have ad inventory management. Uh, this is a great example of something which is, you know, not, something which every app should do because it's only relevant if you've chosen uh, an, an ad attention based model where you're serving exactly. ads to users um, but then if you do it's really important to to understand how to actually serve ads within your app and where are you going to do it and how are you going to bring that inventory to, in front of the user uh, then we've got churn pay a win back um, which is i guess most important for um, you know churn subscribers but could also be just you know folks who in the past have been purchasing a lot um, with in-app purchases and then have suddenly dropped off um, you know how do you get those back um, also important for things like uh, you know e-commerce platforms for example um, you know you want to kind of bring back your high value users uh, we have paywall optimization um, again super important particularly with uh, subscription paywalls um, we see um, the, the apps that are really succeeding there are putting a lot of work into personalizing and optimizing their paywalls um, and finally, pricing. So that could be things like price testing, testing different bundles, um, maybe doing dynamic pricing, uh, or it could be um, managing a virtual currency or virtual economy, particularly important for, for games, for example. Right. I think, um, to me, revenue models uh, is um, the major component, uh, in my estimation, in this stack, because... Um, but like the the mix model to like I believe is to be the best one because it can basically meet um, many different groups, many hordes of your users. For some people, it's easier to just pay a buck and open up some new feature going through the in-app purchase. For some people, they're completely okay with uh, subscriptions. They don't mind to pay extra subscription on top of Netflix, Hulu, and whatever. Just go to with that model. And some people really prefer to just pay one once and do not pay in on every month uh, so just uh, pay it once and, and uh, use the app so um but it's really hard to pull like to include multiple models into your app technically and logistically but if you can do that if your app actually allow to um, include multiple models uh that is that is the best way to monetize your audience you can meet like different cohorts and their preferences. Moving on to the next uh, part, which is tech. So um, uh, like what is involved here? And uh, do you have any suggestions, by the way, for people to use a kind of a single dashboard where every tool was included or that's not possible to have one at, at this point? I think it's... It's one of these things that's like the holy grail that's never going to be found, right? This getting this, close, but not one, really. This like, you know, one one dashboard to rule them all, um, you know, would make life very, very straightforward, I guess. But uh, yeah, no, we, um, you know, we, we haven't seen a commercial solution out there that can integrate all of the various data sources that you need into one dashboard. Um, you know, at Feature, we, you know, we do build custom dashboards for for various of our clients. They, they often want to, you know, have dashboards looking at particular things in a lot of detail, like for example, um, you know, multi-market ASO dashboards and things like this. So we, mm -hmm. you know, we, we, we also build like custom stuff, but like, I don't think we, I don't think, I don't think I've never seen either in-house at a client or something that we've built or a commercial solution that, that covers everything that you might want to look at. That would be a huge dashboard. Um, and you know, you'd get lost in it, I think. So no, unfortunately, um, you know, I think it's it's always going to be the case that there's going to be different tech, different um, you're also going to have different users logging into these different things, right? So um, you know, yeah. what might be super interesting to the DevOps team looking at like low-level, you know, performance data and you know, crashes and stuff like that is not going to be so exciting or or actionable for the marketing team or for you know for the product team you know so it's a diff, different folks they're looking at different stuff um so for that you know for that um you know we've got the tech layer which i which i added basically to it's what i call like a supporting lab these are like enabling capabilities which you could either build in-house or license in um you know there's a lot of off-the-shelf 
um, you know, products out there that can help mobile marketers with this stuff. Um, so uh, first up is behavioral analytics. Um, I call it behavioral analytics, but it's like you could also call this product analytics. Talking about tools like Amplitude, Mixpanel, um, you know, it could be could be um, that you've you know built something similar yourself. But sometimes I also call this investigative analytics. It's basically the ability to look at your you know funnels, user flows. Firebase analytics would be another example of something that gives you this kind of capability to track events and, and, and user behavior, which is why I call it behavioral analytics. Um, super important. Um, and we'll yeah, maybe come back to why that is in, if we have time. Um, attribution and marketing analytics. So understanding how, you know, where users are coming from, um, which is getting harder, of course, with the, uh, the, the, the changes coming in with, with privacy, but um, oh, definitely yeah. still, still possible in a, in a lot of scenarios to, to attribute users either precisely or increasingly less precisely, um, but to try to understand how your marketing campaigns are performing and, and um, you know, how to allocate, how to make decisions around ad, ad spend and, and budget allocation um, you know, is always going to be critical. And we have kind of more nuts and bolts stuff like uh, deep linking. Um, you know, it's not a super sexy topic, but it's really important to get it to work. You need to be able to drive users to all of the different places within your app, um, all of the different pieces of content within your app, um, there needs to be a way to link users there. Um, uh, A-B testing framework, so being able to actually set up and run experiments. Uh, customer engagement platform, often we see companies licensing uh, a platform like Braze or Leanplum or Clevertap, for example, or Iterable um, to do these kind of like multi-channel marketing um, activities and, and build out sort of lifecycle marketing campaigns and flows um, yeah, for things like push notifications, email, uh, in-app messaging, things like that. Uh, then ad monetization SDKs, again, only relevant if you're um, monetizing your app through, through ads. But then if, if so, then you probably need one or, or multiple um, monetization platforms integrated. Uh, subscription SDKs, this is a new one in, uh, in 22. We're seeing um, you know, folks like Purchasely, Revenue Cat, um, Conversion. Yeah. Um, various tools out there that are helping with various aspects of implementing subscriptions, as well as doing sort of subscription analytics, or maybe also paywall optimization and things like that. Um, yeah. Customer data platform, data warehouse, and uh, data visualization as well. So sort of some folks will build a data viz layer on top of their, their data warehouse. Um, and again, just like every other part of the stack, you don't need all of these things in order to succeed in your mobile app. Um, you know, typically we see folks will will buy in some of this stuff at the at sort of early on, like it maybe even pre-launch um, or, or or build out some of this this tech internally, and they'll they'll slowly add more over time as their operation gets more complex and as they get more resources to to do more. You know, it kind of grows with with your app. Yeah, uh, that's like I said, that's the landscape, and your app occupies just certain part of the landscape. A uh, bigger or smaller part, but not the entire uh, landscape uh, as a whole. Now, strategic management, this is one of the toughest buckets in my estimation, because strategy is not an easy thing. It's, it, it's, it's involved uh, long-term thinking, um, trying to build um, you know, the roadmap in advance for a longer period of time, not just you know for the next quarter. So what do we have uh, in this strategic management bucket? Yeah, so, uh, you know, as I said earlier, Art, like, uh, you know, I, for me, um, strategy is all about focus. Uh, and, you know, I added the strategic management layer because uh, what I saw, you know, from experience, basically, from the last five years, consulting with, with a lot of different apps, some of them are, you know, public limited companies, some of them are, you know, VC backed, um, you know, firms of various sizes, some of them are sort of smaller operations, but like outside of just a very small startups, um, typically your kind of growth um, function is gonna be just sort of one part of a, of a bigger organization. And I think the bigger the organization and the more kind of stakeholders or more management layers, um, the more um, emphasis needs to be placed on not just you know, the great growth work that's going on and an application of the mobile growth stack um, you know, to grow the app, but also you know, to think about how to communicate that stuff and coordinate with the other activities that are going on within the business. So um, that's kind of why I added this layer. So we've got things like growth team development, um, how to build out and integrate a growth team within the broader organization um, and, you know, set up reporting lines and stuff like that. 
um, the various ways you can structure that. Um, KPI target setting and tracking. Um, this is again helping to make sort of trade-off decisions and focus areas in, in the context, in the broader context of the business. Um, mm -hmm. Scenario planning, which is kind of like a kind of a classic strategic thinking um, approach, um, which you know it needs to be kind of empowered with data. So in, in order to do proper scenario planning, of course, you need the, all the right insights and input, um, and essentially have like a growth model which you can then use to work with um, with the management team within the company to to look at different scenarios of like you know what uh, and make sort of strategic bets like you know should we increase ac acquisition by 10 percent or should we increase retention try to increase retention by one percent you know most companies can't answer those kind of questions and scenario planning sort of um, supported by a growth model like you know allows you to kind of you know pick pick which scenario is going to be better for you um, company reporting um, yeah again not a super sexy topic but um, you know, these are the kind of activities which uh, which are become pretty essential, like, you know, that are like when when you're doing more than just a sort of a, a small growth team in a, in a startup, um, you need to think about how to actually report um, on these initiatives, you know, within the broader context of the company. Um, and then aligning roadmaps across product, tech and engineering, marketing and content um, and trying to bring all those things together, um, you know, for maximum growth impact. All right, now we have in analytics and insights. That's the biggest uh, chunk of the this landscape of the stack. So what would be like the major part uh, of that of that part? What should like, uh, again, like we said, uh, we're not focusing uh, on some specific thing. Uh, all landscape is more or less equally important depending mm -hmm. like which part is applicable to your app. But if you can pick up from analytics and insights, what would be like the essential part? A couple of essential parts, yeah, because it is it is a big layer. Let's not go through all of the elements of it, but uh, yeah, I, I mean, I do really believe that you know analytics and insights should be the foundation of which you're building your whole kind of growth efforts on. Um, so if you're going to pick a couple, like you know, particularly sort of maybe if you're sort of starting out, the things which are, are most essential, I would say it's getting the data taxonomy and event tracking set up correctly and ideally documented well. Um, you know, we don't see always. Uh, uh, event taxonomy documented very well within organizations. Often it's done by somebody who then has left and then it's been added to right. over time and it gets a bit out of sync between Android and iOS. Uh, again, not a sexy topic, but um, really important to have your fundamental tracking set up properly um, because that's the cornerstone of all of your analytics work. Um, so I'd say if you do one thing right, it's like actually get your tracking set up. Um, and that includes things like attribution as well. Um, and then in terms of like activities which will will really help with analytics um i'd say some of the basics would be cohort analysis that's that's kind of a classic you want to be able to look at your data in a cohorted way see if the, see how those cohorts are developing over time so you know people who joined this month how are they behaving uh, how are they behaving compared to the folks who joined a month ago or two months ago being able to look at stuff in a cohorted way really kind of opens up a whole new layer of insights um, and then funnel analysis, you know, funnels, um, you know, it's just kind of like the classic way of like understanding how many people are getting through certain flows, where are they yeah. dropping off, um, really key to doing growth optimization. So that, that, that would be the ones I pick out. Uh, oh, and one more segmentation. It's, uh, it's kind of essential at some point that you start to segment users um, and address them differently, both, both from just um, the analytics point of view, looking at how they're how different segments are behaving just like you might look at cohorts like co cohorts just a just a form of segmentation actually um but then also how you're actually interacting with those users as well so the uh, ability to segment users uh to create funnels um and to uh yeah to cohort would, would, would be the basics yeah right absolutely uh segmentation this is really essential you're beginning your project uh, your app project with the assumption that you have a profile of your user, people you're trying to reach out with your product, but then as time goes on, you, know, you realize that people are using your app differently and you have to approach them differently, different messaging, um, different, pro probably even uh, different um, models to mo monetize your app with these people. But you have to, uh, you, you have to take into account that uh, having hundreds, thousands, uh, um, sometimes millions of users it's just unavoidable that all these people may interact with their app differently and you have to um you know, just factor in these differences 
final bucket will be management insights. What do we have here? Yeah, uh, thankfully, this is a short one that won't take long. Um, yeah, so management insights, again, I kind of added this uh, in the 22 stack to support the strategic management layer above it. Um, so here we have growth accounting, being able to look at like, not just like how your monthly active users are developing, but also like on a month by month basis, how many new users, returning users, churned users, um, and get that accounting view. Um, growth modeling, which I think I already mentioned, you know, the ability to actually um, properly understand how uh, and project into the future how, how your numbers are going to grow. Um, KPI dashboards. So uh, you mentioned dashboards earlier. So it's like, like I think a, a pretty classic one for management is just sort of like, you know, what are your KPIs? What's your North Star metric? If you're if you're subscribing to the, the North Star kind of paradigm, but in any case, like what are the what are the couple of key metrics that you're trying to optimize towards and can you get like a, a daily or maybe even like hourly snapshot of how they're developing uh, automated reporting um, you know so there might be stuff that you want to look at on a dashboard but there's also stuff you might want in your inbox as a report um, or to be able to generate on demand um, and competitor tracking um, so i think uh, this is something where you know, particularly uh, at a management level like you want to be kind of aware of how the market's evolving because product market fit is not just a, a function of your product. It's also a function mm -hmm. of the market and the market can change pretty rapidly uh, around you. And suddenly, suddenly you don't have product market fit anymore. If you've got a competitor out there that's suddenly eating your lunch. Um, so I think it's important to have competitive tracking in there as well. Yeah. Eating your lunch would be a disaster, let alone to <laughs> stealing your audience for your product. <laughs> uh, yes. Yeah, so Definitely, absolutely. Uh, keeping your eye on your competitors is always important. Like, th these people are not sitting, uh, you know, and not doing uh, anything with their product. They're keeping their eyes on you, and you have to do the same thing for them to be ahead, to have a leg up on the their um, features of their product. So that's kind of it for the overall um, kind of a bird view for the whole stack. Uh, if you're looking for something like this. What is the uh, what, what is the ultimate um, map of activities that can or should be done for an app uh, a project? This is it. Uh, so we're, we're going to be putting definitely we're going to be putting the link to this uh, stack into this episode description. So after listening to our conversation, you'll be able to dig into you know, specifics and have this thing in front of you for your own app project. And again, this is not the to-do list. We're not forcing you to go through every single step. This is the landscape, the spectrum of things that can be done. The app industry is vast. To navigate this space, you need a directory to look up suppliers and partners, and you need to know who are the best. Visit our marketplace directory at businessofapps.com slash marketplace slash podcast. And now back to the show. All right, that was the major topic on the table, and we have just a very uh, small segment with a few questions that I'm asking every guest on the show, because I do want to let people who are listening to me know every guest on this show a little bit better. So quick, rapid fire questions, and question number one, what smartphone do you have? Have you been switching between Android or iOS or staying one side all the time? Uh, yeah, so right now, uh, my, my primary SIM is in a, uh, an iPhone 12. Um, yeah, I've been using this one for a while. Uh, I do try to switch between them pretty often. So I have also a Google Pixel here on my desk. It's got, got a secondary SIM in it. Um, I think it's really important um, to stay abreast of you know, the developments on, on both of the major OSs. Um, it's a bit rarer that I would, uh, I would, I would venture beyond Android and iOS. Um, just, mm -hmm. yeah. But uh, yeah, it used to be that I would, I would play around with, uh, with some, some slightly right. more exotic devices. But uh, yeah, these days it's, it's usually um, uh, yeah, iPhone or, or a, and I, I typically, if I'm going Android, I typically go, would go with the, the Google Pixel as like the kind of reference device. Right. So th that's a smart thing to do, to be on the both platforms professionally, to see what's going on with the latest and greatest. Uh, what was your first mobile phone before smartphone era and that time? Nokia? Uh, yeah. So uh, as I mentioned, I, I joined Nokia right out of um, university. So I was like, I think I was like, you know, like, I guess 20 years old, something like that. I didn't own a mobile phone when I joined. 
Um, mm -hmm. So on my like first week in the office, I was uh, you know getting to play with these devices, um, some of which weren't going to hit the streets for another year or so. Um, but I was allowed to take home not the the, the super um, advanced prototypes, but I was able to you know we, we had I had access to pretty much every Nokia device. So my first phone was um, the Matrix phone, the seventy one ten, uh, which had like the sliding uh, you could click it and it would, and it uh, you know kind of like slides open the the um, the keyboard cover slides down. It's yeah, it's a super super sexy phone. Um, I think still a classic, and uh, yeah, I was able to yeah of course also flash that with a custom rom so uh it always had like the sort of uh in progress versions of the games that i was developing i, I think I, I put like a custom version of pac-man which never actually got released but i had it on my 7110 it's just something that i just coded just to to get to know the um the operating and development environment yeah that's 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 awesome memory to have from those days um now um back to present imagine you've left your Oh, a smartphone at home for whatever reason, what would be the most missing feature for you when you're out? GPS, without a doubt. Uh, my sense of direction is appalling. Uh, I have been known to get lost in small buildings. And, uh, you know, if I was to be outside for any length of time uh, without my smartphone, there's a good chance that I would end up dying of exposure uh, <laughs> or dehydration, possibly within a few hundred meters of my home. Got you. Now, um, are there any features on your uh, iPhone 12 right now uh, that, are, that are actually missing? Uh, could be hardware, software, something that you're kind of thinking, um, wouldn't be great if that thing can do this or that. Uh, it's not necessarily something that is trendy, something that will be particularly useful for you. Missing features. Um, yeah, I don't know. Like the, um, you know, I'm, I'm pretty happy with the the iPhone 12 in terms of like. I remember that the first time that I saw the night camera mode on it, I just like took it out at night and saw the crazy night camera stuff. It's like it's really like something out of a, a science fiction movie. Sci-fi, um, right? Yeah, and uh, so I guess you know, like since a lot of developments going on in 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 the the sort of the, the camera direction, it seems to be where most most of the innovation is happening right now. Um, I guess, you know, something that I would, I would like to see just, just from a fun perspective would be like, um, like full on night vision. So it's like, it's already got pretty good sort of semi night vision, but, but sort of mm -hmm. like something like proper full on infrared cam or something like that would be fun. Um, and then I think like, you know, anything that can, can help with like 3d scanning, um, you know, I got I downloaded an app recently called realize, um, I, I met, um, some folks at a conference the other week, um, from realize it's, um, uh, it's like a, a interior design app. Now I'm not much into interior mm -hmm. design, but this app is really cool. Like you can literally scan your room, um, you know, with with standard smartphone tech as it exists today. Basically, it creates a 3D scan of your room, and then you can start right. placing furniture and moving stuff around within the room. So it's like augmented reality. Um, and I could see that you know with some extra hardware and or software features um, to support augmented reality like that stuff that would like. Do like laser scanning of a room super fast or something like that you could you could create some like really interesting experiences yeah i'm totally with you i remember checking ikea a catalog uh, which was using that feature even before apple introduced api for everybody to use that feature and yeah. even back then it was pretty impressive what ikea was able to pull off um now when we have the uh, later on the latest model or iphone 13 or you know your ipad pro uh, that's just amazing to see that the objects you're putting on in, in your room actually have everything right. The lighting, the shadows, the dimensions, you, you even looks like you're trying to touch that that thing that is not existing. It's only, only in your camera battery. Yeah, it's pretty insane. Yeah, that's that's insane for sure. All right. Very final question before I let you go. How can people get in touch with you and get more information about what you do and do? Uh, yeah, so you can follow me on Twitter, Andy underscore Carvel, C-A-R-V-E-L-L. -L. Um, you can um, always check out what Feature is up to. We have a couple of different blogs on uh, www.feature.com, P-H-I-T-U-R-E.com. Um, you can also get in touch with me via, via the website there. We have a contact form, um, but probably easiest to reach out to me on Twitter. Um, or you can hit me up on email. It's, it's Andy at Feature.com. Terrific. Thank you for coming on the show, Andy. Thank you. Bye-bye. 
Thank you, Art. Thanks for having me. It's been a pleasure. And that was Andy Carvel, partner at Teacher. To listen to more episodes, subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, Teacher, Google Podcasts. Just search for Business of Apps and you will find us easily. We release episodes on Mondays, so subscribe and you'll be able to get new episodes on your smartphone, tablet, or computer if you're still listening podcasts on the computer as soon as we release them. And please don't forget to leave us a review and comment on iTunes. It is highly appreciated. And all episodes will also be available on businessofapps.com. Thank you for listening. See you next week. Thank you for listening to the Business of Apps podcast. For more, head on over to businessofapps.com.